to experience this season two, episode eight, I believe. Uh, my name is Christian Watts with Magpie Travel, and I'm here with Laurie and our two esteemed guests. Laurie. Hey, everyone. I'm Laurie Timoney. I'm one of the co-hosts of Experience This Travel Show and also head of uh, global tra trade sales for Go City. Um, I'm really excited about this show today. Um, I don't know if any of you recall, but last year we had an episode that we titled Women in Travel. And um, we had three guests on that were all senior leaders in their organizations. One of the conversations that we had during that episode was how the bulk of women are making the travel decisions for their friends, for their partners, for their families. Also, the bulk of the employees that are in the tourism and travel space are women, but only 8% of the board positions in the travel space are held by women. Yes, but held by women, exactly. So the bulk of them are men. Um, and obviously that's concerning. And um, we talked a little bit about how we might overcome that in our last show, but we're here to sort of continue that conversation, but with a bit of a new twist, and that twist is on women entrepreneurship. And so I'm really excited to introduce our guest today, um, Iris Serbanescu. Um, Iris is the founder of Women's Work, and uh, Women's Work is a 12-week business accelerator for early stage women and non-binary folk that are really seeking to um, really get some support and community and education around entrepreneurship in the tourism space. And also with us today is Megan Kennedy. Megan is with, she's the founder of Good Trip Adventures, which is a tour operator that focuses on our national parks, um, outdoor tourism. And Megan is also somebody that has participated in the women's work program. So she did um, undertake one of the cohorts. And so she's going to talk a little bit about that. So um, let's start with you, Iris. Um, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about, you know, what problem were you trying to solve? What, what sort of led you to this place where you said, hmm, I think I'll start this, this program and, and get this thing off the ground? So I've been in the industry about 12 years now. And when I first started, um, I think I was there. I came in with really fresh eyes. I really loved the industry. How can you not? Anyone that ever tries to leave this industry comes back. So <laughs> I was really, really happy to be in tourism. But as my, as my career evolved, I started to notice, especially when I worked with small businesses, that the leadership teams and the ownership were always male dominated. And as a woman in the industry, that didn't quite um, sit well with me, I guess. Like I felt the effects of being in a, in a heavily male dominated industry. And I had a wonderful career working for other companies, but around the pandemic, I started to really think about when everyone was talking about how do we build the industry back better? How do we, you know, do things differently once the pandemic is over? I had a lot of time to think, of course. Um, I was still working full, almost full time, but we nothing much else was going on in my life. So I was like, how can I really support the growth of this industry and growth in a better direction than what we've seen so far? And the most prominent thing for me was getting more women into positions of leadership and ownership and leadership was something leadership at other corporations and that kind of thing wasn't something I had a direct uh, impact on or could have a direct impact on. But given my 12 years of experience in the travel industry and my portfolio of contacts and my network and my roles, which heavily were around sales and growth and business development, um, I thought I could do something that moved the needle even a little bit on women gaining more economic ownership in our sector. I actually didn't even know the stats that less, like when I had this business idea, I didn't know that the statistics were so dire in terms of the gender gap. I started doing research after I had the idea to kind of validate and support my thesis that 
we need more women in power in the industry. Um, and I came across the UN second report on women in tourism, found the stats that you mentioned, Lori, and was like, okay, this is not just me. Like, this is not just a problem that I'm facing. Um, and I talked to other women in the industry at the leadership level and at the non-leadership level and at the entrepreneurship level. And we all kind of felt the same, that there was this inequality, a gender gap that we felt in subtle and less subtle ways through our careers. And so um, I had the idea, I waited a couple months and decided to just quit my full-time job and dive in and start women's work. You, and <laughs> you were one of those pandemic, you were born out of the pandemic, right? Like, yes, women's work was a pandemic. So <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. And so when you were looking at developing the framework for the the cohort, so I, I understand it's 12 weeks. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the, you know, sort of, you know, you, you are looking at building community, you, you're obviously, um, you know, bringing in experts, mentors, which I want to talk, talk a little bit about, but would love to maybe have you just kind of give us a sense of the framework of the program. So what am I going to get during this experience? Yeah, great question. So um, a lot of thought goes into each cohort based on who's attending the program. So we've run, now run four cohorts. And the first time I ran it, I didn't really know what to cover. I was a new entrepreneur myself. Um, it was really like the beta cohort, the testing cohort. So that involved a lot of um, research and asking questions to the women who had signed up in um, in that first cohort, as well as to my network. Like, what would you, hey, successful entrepreneur, what would you have wanted to know in your first year of business? Like, what would you have wanted to learn to avoid making mistakes or costly mistakes? Because mistakes aren't bad, but if we can save a bit of money, like, why not? Um, so I started just asking people and like building, building the curriculum that way and finding experts in my network that mirrored the skill set that we needed to bring to these early stage entrepreneurs. So the first cohort was trial and error, but we got great feedback on the curriculum there. And the second, third and fourth cohorts all have built on one another of what we see the common problems are. Now we, uh, you know, it's been two years, we have a repository of what early stage entrepreneurs need the most help with, what they're facing. A lot of them don't know what they don't know too. So like we not, we're not necessarily going to ask them what they need help with. We have a set curriculum of five set classes and then the rest are really adapted to what they need based on who they are, what they're trying to achieve as small businesses. Sometimes we've had cohorts of like pure tour operators, like all tour operators, no, no boutique accommodation, no travel advisors. They're all just selling group trips. So that's going to be a different curriculum than the one that's a little bit broader. Um, and to just give you a taste, we have um, business model canvas 101, which is kind of, it's the alternative to a more arduous business plan. It's not based on so many assumptions and you can do a business model canvas in like 20 minutes um, if you want. Um, we also have Mindset 101 as part of our standard curriculum, pricing, financial analysis and forecasting, um, and then a couple of marketing ones, you know, either lead generation or digital marketing, whatever works for that cohort. The rest of the, pro the, rest of the curriculum is based on what people are looking to get out of it and what we think could best support those folks who have applied. So everyone fills out an intake form before they join so that we really understand where they're coming from and yeah, what they want to get out of it. Sounds like an amazing program. Christian, you're so tuned into the um, travel space, especially for the experiences industry. Do you, number one, do you see, would you have, would you yourself have thought, okay, there's a need for this. And two, um, do you see other programs in this space that are doing anything similar, whether it be male, female, whatever, are it, it, do you see this as an opportunity anywhere else other than what you've seen here or what you've heard here? Yeah, I mean, hundred percent. There's a need for it, right? I mean, I'm in San Francisco, and it's all YC this, YC that. I mean, it's all. I, I don't. Was YC the first, or they're just the biggest? I'm not. I'm not sure. But, I think um, they were the first. Yeah. Yeah. 
And because Airbnb and, and a million other companies have come through that, you know, they've got the brand name and it's it's a fantastic program from what I've from what I hear. So I think absolutely there's a model. And it's it's it it completely makes sense, really. It's 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 school for for startups and it's school that comes along with the network and everything else I was just mentioned. So hundred percent I, I see it. I I've never been through an accelerator or incubator or any of those things, but sometimes I even stop now and think would it, would it, is this is this too late to go through people still tell me i should go through yc now even even with a startup that's been around for a few years and i'm saying no but i've already been through this and i i know these things and i've got the network and i find reasons why i shouldn't if it was if it was in person i would have probably applied to yc two years ago um but it was all remote when i was thinking about it so I think yeah. absolutely. I, I think it's not just for people that are just starting out either. It's people that may be moving from a different industry or that just want to sort of jump start their business from where they're at right now. So I think it's a great yeah. model. Well, what what is the model, by the way? What what's your sort of financial side pricing? Yeah. So we have two revenue. Well, we have one revenue stream. It's it's price. It's priced. So there's no equity. It's an equity free accelerator. We everybody invests a certain amount. At the moment, the current cohort is four thousand dollars for twelve weeks plus twelve months of support following the program, and we have a scholarship uh, model as well. So we've had corporations come in and sponsor scholarships for folks um, who identify as BIPOC, LGBTQ+, and or disabled. So in that way, we're able to open up spots for them to join at like 15% of what the actual full cost would be. And about 30% of our spots are um, scholarship spots, but the rest are paid. Okay. And for, so, for things like YC, it, it, and, that, and that's probably different, but it's all about demo day, right? So you go through the program and then they're going to put you in front of every VC in, in Silicon Valley on the final day, whatever. And if you've been through YC, you've kind of got the stamp of approval to say that you're now somebody, which, which I get that works for them. But is is that a focus or are you not really into the fundraising? Is it is it just a different path potentially? Yeah, exactly. So we don't offer fundraising opportunities or connections with VCs right now. A lot of our businesses are lifestyle businesses. They don't want to waste their time pitching to investors when the model just isn't ripe for scaling up. Um, but we do have a demo day, actually. And the demo day is is for folks to get industry partnerships and just get their name out there. So we send it to our whole database. Our partners send it to their whole database. We get like hundreds of people involved in just coming and seeing who our new ventures are. And Megan actually presented at our demo day last in December. That was our very that's, first. That's, 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 that sounds, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm loving everything I'm hearing right now. And um, particularly because you're addressing that need that we kind of mentioned at the beginning, which is that, you know, how many women, have the confidence potentially, you know, to, to kind of go after something like this and perhaps they might be more inclined to enter into a program like this where they feel a little bit more comfortable and maybe not as threatened. So I, I, I'm really, this is, this is really sitting, sitting uh, well with me. Um, Megan, can you talk a little bit about, so, you know, obviously you, you've, You've got a background. Um, you, I mean, maybe you could tell us a little bit about, you know, sort of how you came to this and what made you decide to join the program. Um, you know, what was it? Where were you at in your life at that point where this just seemed to be a good idea? Yeah. So Good Trip was also a COVID company, um, sort of an unexpected COVID baby as well. Um, and I was actually more than three years into um, the operation of Good Trip when I think it was actually my mom ran into Iris at um, a panel of, of something else and was like, oh, you got to you got to check this out. So my mom's also an entrepreneur and has been absolutely, you know, an instrumental in my path to ownership and, and entrepreneurship myself. Um, but it's always nice to kind of move that externally from the family at, at, at some point as, as lucky as I am to have, you know, my mom to, to give me advice. Um, sometimes yeah, it's nice to get that from someone else as well. So she recommended that I connect with Iris. We did an intro call and Iris even kind of acknowledged the fact that maybe my business was a little bit, um, kind of beyond 
the typical, you know, startup that would be joining. So um, Christian, to, to your point, I actually don't think after having experienced this, that it is ever too late because um, I, what I got out of it were a few things. One was the network. That was something that like so much of the formation of, of Good Trip was kind of reactionary in COVID. Uh, we were born out of another company. There's a lot of reasons why, why we started um, and started as women and queer owned and with that kind of focus on inclusivity in the guiding world, both in the the leadership side, but also in the guide side, because that's also been historically kind of like white, cis, het males. Um, and so we're trying to expand that a little bit as well. Um, but yeah, the, the network that Iris has put together, um, and I think I was kind of saying this yesterday, that it's not just the network that's in the cohort. It is every time I did you know, one of the webinars or one of the classes, I set up that 30 minute call afterwards and asked them like, who do I need to know? And they recommended three different people that I needed to talk to. And they have been exactly the right people that I needed to talk to at the right time in my business. Um, and then the other thing, even just kind of being a little bit older um, of a company was just some like confirmation that I was doing things correctly. So whereas like maybe a newer business might learn something for the first time, I just was existing in this bubble of like, I'm figuring things out. Am I doing everything right? Are there things I don't even know that I don't know? And sometimes the answer was yes. And sometimes the answer was actually like, you're now taught, you've been connected with someone who was the leader at REI experiences, you know, for 20 years and they're doing things in Excel spreadsheets. And so you don't actually need to worry that there's like some better program that you're doing, like you're you're doing everything all right. And so even just that was hugely beneficial, um, you know, just to make sure that you're on, you're on the right track and that, you know, you're not kind of missing anything. Um, so yeah, that was, that was hugely beneficial to me. And I've even decided to, you know, stay as part of the alumni program and continue with some of the accountability, I find that can be pretty, pretty challenging as an entrepreneur to not get kind of stuck in the weeds. And I think having that, that community that's kind of holding you accountable and weekly meetings with folks to kind of think beyond the day to day is just, I think that's helpful at any point in, in business for sure. Yeah. I love that. I love that, um, that piece about mentorship and community and accountability. I thought that was really, um, well, I was really intrigued by that. And Iris, I was wondering, so how do you find the people, where do these experts come from? So where do you, you know, kind of dig these people up? Where are the people that are holding Megan accountable for, you know, her various initiatives? Good question. Honestly, like in early in my career, I spent so much time going to trade shows, which now I can't even fathom doing more than three a year. Hey, it's Merica from the Von Mack Agency here with your tourism marketing half minute. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the fallacy that tourism is recession proof. Yep, that's definitely not true. So in today's economy, it might be a good time to start thinking about scarcity marketing. This is a technique that focuses on creating a sense of urgency and excitement all around your product. And studies have shown that customers are 30% more likely to purchase something when they believe it'll sell out. So try offering limited time packages, exclusive discounts, or even something VIP, but make sure to A-B test your results. Um, <laughs> 12%. Christian, don't get Christian started on this because I mean, that's like a whole nother conversation. <laughs> Honestly, like, why do we get so tired of trade shows? I'm getting old, but, um, no, I really built my network over the first few years of my career. And that just like continued to flourish. And then as I've stepped into entrepreneurship again, like people are attracted to the mission of women's work. So I'll have people reaching out to me on LinkedIn. Um, so everything's quite organic. And then what happens is that I come up with the curriculum. I always keep people in mind. We try to prioritize also like women of color and people like from marginalized backgrounds to teach these workshops as well. We really want to amplify those voices and like help others in the program see that like there are people like them that are succeeding. And so our whole thing is around equity, right? So anytime I come across someone that I'm like, wow, they're doing really cool stuff. 
I just kind of file their contact info away and then reach out to them to have a chat even before I curate the program. And so I kind of, I do a lot of online prospecting and network building without having to always be in person, um, especially over the pandemic. So that when we curate the curriculum, I have like basically a black book of like people that would be great to teach. And then we have application forms and interview processes. So, um, and also referrals, a lot of, you know, I'll post on LinkedIn and people will tag others that are like, they'd be great for this topic and no, no, no. So yeah, that's how I do the expert recruitment. Really cool. And Christian, um, so if when it comes to somebody like a mentor, have you yourself ever had a mentor? No, somebody somebody asked me on a um actually an old college friend of mine, not old, a, how do you say that? A college friend of mine. <laughs> former? <laughs> yeah, former college friend. Um she she does a podcast now and she asked me, you know, what would you do differently and all that stuff if you if you started again? And I thought about it a bit and I said I would have had mentors because I think when you just start now in, in my 20s I started my first business and you don't know what you don't know as, as Iris said earlier and having a mentor would have been I made so many mistakes when when I started out just because I was probably overconfident and you need a bit of that as an entrepreneur I was just plowing into things and doing I, I, I did everything I started a bus company and bike rentals and rollerblades and t-shirts and everything and um <laughs> If I'd had a mentor, they would have said, stop, calm down, focus. The things that you <laughs> should know as an entrepreneur, but don't if you're just running at 100 miles an hour. So I think mentorship's fantastic. I think everyone should look at that. Um, but it's maybe it's the young people that don't know that until it's until 20 years later when they, uh, when they look back. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, I, I the whole subject of, of mentorship you know, where do you start, right? If you're not connected to an organization, you don't have that, um, you know, you just don't know where to go for it. It sounds like a great idea, but then what is exactly does it mean? And how do you even choose your mentor? Like, you know, so I guess that would be a question. Megan, who's your mentor right now? So, I would say my my mom is a huge one, um, but that was something that was really appealing about women's work is that you are matched with a mentor for the duration of the program. Um, and so they're thinking about all of those things for you. Iris hand-selected Casey for me and she was perfect. Um, so we worked together over the course of, I think we had six sessions um, and you know we were able to kind of talk about getting me ready for our end of the year retreat. But, you know, I've also kind of, um, so like we worked on some leadership things and things to talk about, things to focus on. And she definitely asked me questions and kind of pushed me in in ways that I definitely wouldn't have been able to do on, on my own. Um, but yeah, there were even some weeks that I showed up and I sort of equated it to therapy where I thought like, what are we even gonna have to talk about this week? Thing, things are fine right now. And I show up and she asks the right question and I'm like, oh, Oh, we can talk about this for a full hour today and and probably beyond that. And so, um, you know, there is, um, I, I'm not sure how I think mentorship can work in a lot of different ways. I have had mentors in the past, especially when I was kind of a full-time guide and less on the entrepreneur or managerial side of things. Um, I had mentors that were just helping me work through, you know, kayak guiding curriculum. And they were the people that were doing teaching and then training and so there was some payment, but also we were just kind of like going out and kayaking together. So there wasn't really like a monetary exchange there except for courses. Um, you know, with women's work to continue with that mentor, there was payment, which certainly there's value there. I actually, because we have three owners at Good Trip, passed Casey on to another one of our owners who I thought could really benefit from working with her at that time. So our investment has gone into um, working on mentorship with another uh, one of our founders. So I think we might just kind of share Casey um, throughout the year if, if possible. Casey if sounds you're... great. Maybe I should yeah. <laughs> check her out. She so um, what do you what do you think that the biggest challenge maybe that you had that perhaps um, going through women's work has helped you either solve or mm -hmm. just get clearer on? Mm -hmm. 
the biggest thing has been the financial side of things. And that's where I have actually said, I've, I've talked to people as far as like the referrals are concerned. I think anyone in any industry could benefit from going through something like women's work, if not pretty much exactly women's work. However, the benefit has been that everything has been thought about from that travel industry perspective. And again, having it be women and gender expansive and, and women of color led, I mean, that's just, you're not seeing that. I'm not seeing that in other places. Um, and that's been really important because I went to one of the webinars about the tech stacks. And again, it was one of those things where I went through it. Um, I'm feeling like, okay, she's mentioning a bunch of things that we're kind of already doing. Cause again, we're, we're turning four this weekend. So we've got a lot of tech already set up. We've got our CRM. We're using Fair Harbor. We're, you know, we're using Stripe. We, we've got all that stuff. And we've got um, through our CRM, all of our social stuff. Everything's automated now. You know, we're letting the computers do the computer. That's great. So I, I was kind of like, what else? And, and so part of women's work is you get to set up this 30 minute call with the experts afterwards. And I always took advantage of that. So I, I emailed the woman who led that course. And I was like, the one thing I feel like I didn't really get information on or want more information on is like financial tech stuff. Cause that's something that we've kind of struggled with. And especially as a tour operator and a travel agency, there are kind of specific things about travel that like QuickBooks doesn't let you do certain things. If you're in the travel industry that like, if you just go to any financial person, they'll be like, Oh, invoice this way. Well, they don't know that QuickBooks doesn't let you do that if you're in travel, you know, um, even just like things like selling your products in the TikTok shop. Well, you can't do that if it's a, a service. And so there's advice that people will give you that's not tailored to the travel industry. So that's been really great. I emailed this woman and she said, I don't necessarily know if I can help you, but I'm going to introduce you to this woman, Ingrid, that I know. She calls herself the priestess of profits. She's like the most woo-woo financial person you've ever... Iris, have you encountered Ingrid? No, I, she sounds amazing though. I need she's, to. Oh my she's God. In Oregon, first, isn't she? She's in the, Oregon. Yeah, she's Prophet. In Prophet. Oh, you yeah. know, you know her, Kristen. She's, Incredible. Know her. And not only is she so knowledgeable about the specific in and outs of travel industry finance, she started the call with this like intention we were all like, we had closed our eyes. We were sobbing by the end of it. And like, that is just something that if I had been connected with a finance bro, I might've gotten <laughs> some good advice, but like, we just opened up and it was like, every time we meet with her good, she's like, how are you doing? And we're all like, it's really hard. And we like cry for the first 10 minutes and then we get shit done. And like, that is exactly how I want to do business. I don't want to have to like be tough and crusty when I show up to a meeting, like, things are going on in our lives. And, you know, one of my co-founders was talking about like, she, you know, she's become a mother during the pandemic, not only to the business, but to like a human child and like all of those sort of realities of, of, so you know, just womanhood and yeah. that, that you're, that you're kind of bringing into the equation, which yeah. is so cool. So Christian. cool. So she was just the perfect, perfect person at the perfect time for us. Yeah. Christian, have you, you obviously have women in your organization that you work with, that you, that you, that are working for you. Um, do you feel like there's differences there in the way that they might approach like a meeting, um, a, a, a conference room, um, a challenge, um, you know, just do you find that you have to sort of modify the way that you consider a conversation or, you know, a strategy meeting or how, how do you think about that? I don't think I ever really have. I mean, if, if I go back to my bus company days, that was easier to talk about because there's a lot more people that, that, that was all, that was almost like segregated that because but bus drivers, 99% men, we did everything we could, but I, I don't know why that ends up, but every company is the same. Um, and my management group were probably 80% women, but I, ne I never sort of sat down. I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I never sat down to think anything differently about approaching a meeting. I, I, when I, I'm listening to Megan talk, if I jumped on a financial call with that, with someone and, and the first 10 minutes was, was that, I, I, that would, that would be pretty upsetting for me to, to go through that call. But, but that's interesting because I, I, I'd be more into the tech bro. 
which I think is the point, right? Mm -hmm. You're getting more of the tech pro calls and actually that's not what you want. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's wrong of me not to consider that I should be running meetings. I, I just always run meetings the way I, the way that I think is natural to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, that's very it. honest. And, yeah. uh, and it, I guess it speaks to kind of, you know, how we sort of started the conversation. Um, so Iris, back to women's work and, and to, to, to your, to your role and so forth. So what do you, if you think about women in leadership roles, what do you view as sort of the strengths in, you know, a woman as a leader? Um, what, what do you think, how do you think that whole sort of framework changes when it's a women or, or, or a non-binary person in that role? Good question. I mean, we all as humans have feminine and masculine traits. Um, of course, in some, in most cases, women tend to have more feminine traits, and some of those feminine traits are creative problem solving, creativity in general. Um, and again, we all have this, men and women and gender diverse folks. Um, empathy and like an ability to broaden the worldview a little bit to encompass other viewpoints. I also am in my masculine energy sometimes a lot of the time and have tunnel vision. So like, I can't say that I'm the most like, broadest perspective, but I try to consider other people's perspectives as a leader. Um, and I don't believe, and this is controversial probably, but like business is not just business, like people run businesses. And I think it's super important for talent retention and just like running a business ethically that you consider other people, how they feel, their situations, etc. cetera. Um, that hasn't failed me so far. So that's good. Um, and I think an understanding of the market, because if you think about women outside of travel, even with, like most of the people that make purchase decisions for some products are, are also women. And so when women are in leadership positions, they have a better understanding of a diverse market and can actually make decisions that that impact those women. Like a lot of women's products back in the day and still now are created by a boardroom of men because that's who's at the top. So they don't have an understanding of the um, needs of the market, whereas a woman in leadership does have an understanding of the needs of the market. And if you think about how much buying power women have, especially in tourism, as you mentioned, it's actually like such a miss to not have women in leadership. So I think everybody benefits when there are more women at the top. Um, and I think like, uh, yeah, it's just, a balance is very key. Like it's not about being in the Barbie movie, but really like thinking about how we can create more equity at the top and create more hospitable environments for women. Even like um, what you mentioned, Christian is so interesting and great that you, like what you're doing is working for you. You are obviously successful and you have, I mean, even just in talking to you, like you have a great understanding of the problem we're solving and like how to work with women and all of that. But one like key thing about women in meetings is they get talked over sometimes. And I think that's one small change that we can all make in our organizations is to like, if you're noticing that somebody's not talking or somebody's being interrupted, just like go directly to them and be like, did you have something to say? Or like, I noticed this person interrupted you. Did you want to say something because like, we don't always, we can't always advocate for ourselves. We try to, but there, is, there are some things we can do as a society to just elevate equity in like the smallest of ways. It's not just about hiring more people on your leadership team, but like really at the grassroots level, what can you do to make others feel more comfortable? And it's not necessarily gender specific, but it does get seen more on the um, women's side. So yeah, I, I think I've always relied on maybe my senior women management to set me straight if I do something wrong. But I think that's one thing to, to bring men into the conversation. I, I, was, I was talking to, I've forgotten the guy's name, started an events company, events platform. 
I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, he, he went from startup, built it in his basement, raised 800, um, raised 800 million in the first six months, company valuation of 8 billion and sold it last year for like 18 million. He went from nothing to everything to nothing again. But anyway, my point is nine months after he started in his basement, he's running this $8 billion company. Everyone's interviewing him like he's been around for 30 years and knows everything. <laughs> he's the same kid that nine months ago you wouldn't have spoken to because he's just a kid in the basement building, hacking it together some software. So everyone expects the leader to know what they're doing just because they're called the CEO. But often it's just someone that's just come across this and didn't actually think through what being the CEO means and never been through training on how to run a meeting or how to manage all these people. So I think you rely on the rest of your team to stand up. So if it's if I'm over talking or if somebody's over talking women in a meeting, I might never see it because I've never been trained to look for that. So I'd, I'd like if I was with you, Laurie, I'd expect you to come to me afterwards and say, Christian, you know, what are you, what, what's, what's wrong with you? you? You did this and you did that. But I think it needs more women to sort of stand up Maybe not for themselves, but for other women. And I, I don't think for it's both, necessarily really. men are trying to do that, but we just don't know it. We don't see it. Or we don't hear yeah. it. That's actually, I remember having this exact conversation in the last um, show that we did on, on women and travel is the idea that, you know, one of the things that can be done is to have women and men standing up and saying, wait a second, you know, that person wants to speak right now. And actually we haven't heard from them and they probably, they may have something to say. Um, and I think that's definitely something, you know, just just opening up that space, right? Opening up that opportunity. And, you know, to your point, Iris, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, presenting places where um, diversity is welcome where um, everybody's welcome, right? And that makes me think about what Megan is doing with Good Trip Adventures. And um, I wanted you just to talk a little bit about that because I, you know, just really only read your website. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with this. But you talk a little bit about how, you know, everybody's welcome. Um, we don't, you know, we don't want hate speech of any kind. We're 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 really um, looking for sort of a. Not only do you talk a little bit about the diversity, but you also talk about sustainability. And I mentioned to you yesterday that I wanted to know a little bit more about what that meant actually on the ground, because one of the things that we talk a bit about is lots of businesses say oh, you know, we're, we're, we're very inclusive, or they talk even about, you know, things relating to carbon offsetting, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes, you know, push comes to shove, it's not always the case that they're walking the walk. And I just want to understand how you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a, a great question to probably ask all companies that are, yeah, kind of talking about that um, because I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think a lot of companies now might have been around for 50 years and have had mostly, yeah, cis, het, male, white male leadership. And then they're trying to, to switch things. They're trying to have scholarships for historically excluded folks. Um, and I think the big thing as a, a women and queer founded company is that inclusivity is baked into the, the DNA of, of Good Trip from the start. That's been a part of it. And when you have a diverse staff, you have the trust of new people that might apply kind of baked in. Um, so, you know, the fact that our guide team and our, our office staff is more than 75% women, queer, trans, BIPOC folks, folks just can tell by looking at who's on our website that they're going to be safe there. We still get asked questions. Like when people are applying, they they will ask us like, how am I made to feel safe? And, you know, we make sure that we're talking about that internally with our team. And we're doing things like making sure that if we're going to make a post about, you know, uh, the trans bathroom situation that's going on in Utah right now, that like, we're going to call in our, you know, trans members of our staff and say, how do we word this correctly? And how do we make sure like you're feeling supported in this time? So really not letting them come to us about it, but making sure that we're reaching out to them. And we've certainly 
failed in in some ways about that. There have been times where, uh, but but we've set the culture that in fact, when we have failed, our team has been able to come to us and say, you dropped the ball on this one. Like you could have reached out to me first. I shouldn't be having to come to you. And we're like, we're right. At the same time, I'm glad that we've done enough in the past to build that trust that you knew you could come to me, you know? So that's really big is it's really hard to kind of change things once if, if you've got a kind of homogenous team to then say like, Hey, diverse people we're hiring. Well, like, do they feel like they're going to be heard in board meetings if they're the kind of token? You know, I, we hear that as feedback of like, I'm afraid to even apply there if I don't know. A lot of it too is referrals. So like people that uh, of certain intersections and, and demographics will reach out to their friends and say, I've had a really great experience working with Good Trip. Maybe you should apply for one of their scholarships. Um, so we do offer scholarships to historically marginalized people um, to get into the field of guiding. So wilderness first responder is pretty much like the first certification that anyone needs to become an outdoor guide. So we offer you know regular scholarships and low cost because we do in in house training for that, um, and we can offset that so it's totally free for folks. And then we offer monthly educational support to kind of work them through their training um, and you know paid shadowing trips and things like that. That you know the monetary barrier, but also just if you don't have a support staff because people have been you know certain groups have been excluded from outdoors and outdoor leadership. Um, we try to become that that support system again, both like educationally, but also like community wise. So that's been the big thing is sort of diversity begets diversity, which is is I really can, great. It's, it makes a lot of sense. So yeah. we're running out of time, but um, what I'd love to do is um, first of all find out, Iris, what's next for you? What what's the what's next on the list? Um, you know, for women's work. Any new ideas, any uh, anything that we should be watching out for? Yes, thanks for asking. Um, so we have our next cohort starting September 16th. Um, that's when the next program is running and applications are open now. So if you're listening and this sounds like you, please, please apply if you need support in your tourism business. And then the other program we're launching, the, the date is not specified yet but we are looking at launching an ideation lab for folks that just have business ideas and don't want to bounce them off their friends and family because you know the response you're going to get from them like they're not industry experts and sometimes they're afraid to see you take a I love, I love that idea I love I, we, we talked a little bit about that and I just love that idea what a, I feel like you're going to get to a lot of people who are looking for that help hope yeah. so yeah thank you so that's we'll we'll keep if folks want to follow us on linkedin or instagram um please do and we'll keep you updated on when that program is launching but lots of fun stuff in the pipeline sounds good and what about you megan yeah so uh short-term exciting things is we're launching we're launching a new website uh actually this weekend so it's our um fourth anniversary so we have a lot of we've got giveaways going on so same thing if you want to follow us at Good Trip Adventures um, on Instagram, TikTok, all of that fun stuff. Um, we're going into our busy summer season. So we've got trips running in 30 of the 63 US national parks, um, expanding into Alaska this year, which is is really exciting. But yeah, we've got lots of spots open on our, our group travel um, this summer, as well as all of our custom private itineraries. Um, so yeah, just kind of having a good time in the national parks this summer. <laughs> And I think your next idea should be an ideation lab, potentially, you know, you, <laughs> I think Christian kind of is an ideation, like literally, you have more people that I'm sure come to you all the time for advice, I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, people reach out on, yeah, on LinkedIn, I, I, I was just thinking, though, you know, the, the people that reach out, I'm trying to work out the, the ratio of people that reach out and we've got a couple of slap groups that we talk about AI. I'm not going to talk about AI, but it's, but it's mostly men that talk and maybe that's a confidence thing that they're the ones that are confident enough to reach out and start chatting on an open slack group. But it does, I'm just, cause AI is a new thing for almost everyone in the world outside of a few really geeky people. It's, it's, it's brand new for all of us. Right. And it's immediately become this sort of cohort of men. I feel like, 
Yeah, we need it to change that right now before it goes too much further. So I have an idea on that one. I'm going to talk to yeah. you about it. But but uh, <laughs> my, my 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 final point on that is this: is that it, it's it's an open topic right now. It, it is the future of the world, and I don't know what it takes for women to get involved immediately, but it's definitely not too late. But the it, yeah, it, it's 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 a difficult situation already. I'm not sure if that's because of previous biases. My LinkedIn. Maybe it has too many men on it already. Therefore, it stays. I'm not sure why that happens, but it seems to be mm -hmm. happening again. Well, you know what? This is the beginning, cool. though, right? Is just having the conversation and identifying an issue, and then you know, yeah, it's the it's it's a it's the start. Um, yeah. Well, I just want to say thanks to both of you for joining us today. This has been a really nice conversation, and um, I really am so impressed with what you both have have done and. Um, yeah, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. This has been so fun. Appreciate yeah, thanks. it. Thanks. Keep up the good work.